All right, I see some more arrivals, so we will go ahead and start our session. Thank you so much for joining me for today's session on building a trusted brand. We'll talk about the data behind trust and how to build trust in practice. Um, whether you're a startup, which I know many organizations joining SOCAP this week are in startup mode, the organization I'm with is also a startup, so I think we speak the same language there. However, you could also be from a longstanding organization or nonprofit venture. Um, but regardless of the type of organization you're in, what I want you to walk away with today is an understanding of where trust comes from, why investing in trust is a good idea and actually an imperative for your organization as we move forward, and how you can get started on building trustful relationships that will lead your brand to success. Just a little bit of information about myself. My name is Pam Fitzpatrick. I am the head of the ESG Center of Excellence at OneTrust. We are a tech startup, software as a service based in Atlanta. I'll talk a little more about that at the end of the session. But about myself, I have spent about 20 years in different sustainable development roles. I spent the early part of my career in community development and regional economic development in Pittsburgh, which is my hometown. In the past eight to 10 years, I have been working in the corporate side. So at Gartner, I was an analyst in the supply chain research group where I developed and built out our practice for sustainability and circular economy research and advisory services for corporations. Uh, then I went to work at Macy's as the first vice president of sustainability there, where I oversaw responsible sourcing and ESG disclosure and sustainable products. And then here at OneTrust, I am working as part of a center of excellence, a group of centers of excellence in our trust center, led by our chief trust officer, uh, thinking about how we can implement trust and build uh, an ESG strategy for one trust internally, but also help our customers uh, and the industry along the way, kind of redefining what trust means and how we can go about our ESG integration journeys together. Despite all of this experience, which I know sounds very vast and impressive, I can tell you personally speaking, I have spent more time thinking about trust in the past six months. And that is because I met this little creature named Sally. Sally uh, was a cat who showed up on a property. We moved We moved here about six months as of last week. We bought this house six months ago. And on our second day, we saw this girl walking across our property with something in her mouth, uh, which we soon realized was a kitten. And we saw her carrying a couple more of them across our property. And I've been a cat person my whole life but I've never taken an astray or interacted with a stray. And I just couldn't let this girl be out there with her kittens on her own. So uh, I started kind of introducing her, introducing myself with some tuna and some milk, kind of bringing out the good stuff. And from there on out, it really became a study for me. And what does it take to build trust? Where does trust come from? How do I make it happen with a with a cat, with a being with which I can't really have any verbal communication? Uh, and I'll tell you, it took a, just a lot of thoughtfulness and real understanding of what it means when I put the food in one place versus another and how she responds to that. I didn't touch her for weeks. I let her initiate kind of contact with me. And eventually she led me to the tree where she was keeping her three kittens. And now I'm happy to say that all four of them are part of our family. So it was interesting as I, as I came to this role at One Trust this summer, the trust had been something that was on my mind. And the definition that I started operating with in context with Sally and her kittens is one I think we can actually use in our own business context too, is this trust is doing what you'll say you'll do, when you say you do it, and doing it consistently, sort of unfailing in your ability to continue to show up and follow through on the things that you say that you're going to do. It's only when you have that consistent demonstration of following through that you build that trust that, that really serves as the base of a, a basis of a strong and loyal relationship. And I think we spend a lot of time talking right now, I think, particularly in the business community, about the importance of purpose and purpose is important, but I'm going to make the argument today that trust is even more important and that purpose without trust 
will actually create some problems for you. So I'd encourage you to think about uh, whether you're a startup or a longstanding organization, what are the things that we can do to start advancing, really focusing our organization on not just purpose, the why are we here, but trust. How is it that we're going to show up? What are we going to do? Uh, and how are we going to do that consistently? And that's what I'd like us to, to talk about today. So what does trust mean? Well, you know, a few years ago, I was thinking about trust in teams in my workplace. And I listened to a podcast with Adam Grant. Many of you may listen to him. And he talked about the difference between inherent trust and earned trust. And inherent trust is the trust we kind of show up with, right? We're all members of the same team. So we work with this common assumption and some social lubrication that just helps us get the basics done together. We all show up to the same meetings. We tend to follow through on the kinds of things we say we're going to do for one another. We work with this common understanding that we're all there to accomplish the same goal. But what really takes us to the next level of performance and the next level of benefits is earned trust. And earned trust is the trust that we have to earn. It's the trust that we get credit for only when we say what we're going to do, we follow through on that, and we do that consistently. The challenge is when you're running an organization, there's one thing to build that relationship with a cat or a team member. But when you're thinking about what trust means and how you cultivate it for your entire organization, it means that showing up and doing what you say you're going to do across many different fronts. It shows up in your reliability, your vendor relationships, how you manage ethics, your community impact, your employment policies. And you have to think about that consistency across every piece of your operations. So how do we go about getting there? It sounds simple in theory. As you can see, when you're trying to manage it across all of these places, it's harder in practice. But the imperative for doing so is that we know, and we've certainly seen and continue to see many examples of where brands are either built by trust or broken by trust. Organizations that are either new or have been around forever can be that trust can be shattered within, you know, sort of a, a tweet, really. So how do we go about making this happen? And why is it so important now? I think one of the things that we're very cognizant of here and we're talking a lot with our customers about is that it's trust that is really driving the next decade of growth and differentiation. So if we look back over the past couple of decades of how organizations have run, how businesses have prospered, in the 2000s, competition was really based on the price and the quality of your product. Are you able to deliver high or decent quality product at an optimal price? Right? And that kind of led to lots of operational decisions on how we focus on resource efficiency, how we make things as economical as possible, which has consequences both inside and outside our business. But those were really how you competed, price and quality. 2010s, we saw some different things emerge, right? And that is the layering on of experience and engagement. A lot of this was due to the rise of social media. We had new ways of interacting with our customers and experience and engagement became key differentiators in the market. Well, like all great innovations, you know, there were some unintended consequences that came with that rise of social media. And a lot of that related to disinformation and mistrust. And for that reason, we really think going forward in the next decade, what's going to be the differentiators of your organization are your ability to deliver transparency to your customers and other stakeholders and leverage that transparency as a platform for building trust. That's what's going to set you apart. And the organizations that get that right, that choose that as their North Star and stick to it, they are the ones that are going to be built to last. Stakeholders want to know not just what you offer, not just what is your product or service or what you stand for or the mission that you have in the world, right? But how are you going about getting it done? How do you run your business? And do you run it that way consistently or do you kind of come out with some messaging and then kind of go in a different direction when needs and circumstances uh, would cause you to kind of stray from your path? That's what's going to make the difference. We can see signs that this is already happening, but I think what's helpful for you to understand is like what becomes possible when trust is strong. We see four kind of key levers that organizations can tap into when, when they've invested in trust 
what are the benefits that they gain from it? What are the sort of areas in which you build your business case for creating trust? First is competitive differentiation. As I just explained on the last screen, you know, you are looking for ways to differentiate your brand by consistently demonstrating trust and transparency. Second is attracting investors or donors. The expectations have changed. Organizations, funders are looking at your long-term play and your long-term value. Being able to show that you have a commitment to sustaining trust with your key stakeholders as part of your value proposition is going to have strong appeal. Third is simplifying compliance. I was just talking to someone yesterday who was saying when she was in a uh, manufacturing firm, there was a, an occasion in which the plant that she was working with or within kind of missed a deadline on a key permit. And, you know, they had good track record and in, in compliance with the laws related to this permit, but they just somehow completely missed the deadline. Something fell through the cracks. So what did they do? They went to the regulator and they confessed, hey, we made a mistake. We missed our, our repermitting deadline. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, we here, but here's the reason why we would like to work with you. We've had a great track record in the past. We've had no non-compliance issues. We have followed through on everything. When there has been an issue, you know, we've been able to work with us. And because of that relationship of trust and that strong track record that they built, they were able to work with the local regulators and get an extension on that permit. So there are benefits when it comes to compliance. If you've proven yourself to be a trustworthy organization, chances are that regulator is going to look upon you favorably and be willing to negotiate with you or work with you or collaborate with you because you have already demonstrated your ability to work as a trusted citizen. And then finally, improving company culture. Uh, you know, this is the ticket to a training or attracting and, and retaining top talent. You want to look for that alignment with values, purpose, accountability. Trust is, if you put trust at the center, you'll see that it reframes all of your employee conversations. And we'll talk more about these in depth. But there are signs already that this kind of thinking is beginning to pay off for organizations and that trust can fundamentally, fundamentally change your commercial outcomes. So uh, Boston Consulting Group released a study earlier this year kind of showing what happened during COVID last year between COVID unrest related to the, the murder of George Floyd had massive consequences for business. And some of those businesses were able to bounce back more quickly than others. If we can look, you can see the plummet that happens in the chart on the right, starting in April 2020, when COVID was really sweeping across America. But then look at the sort of gap that emerges between two different cohorts of companies. In the blue line, we have the top 10 most trusted companies, according to a 2019 study. And then in the yellow line, we have the MSCI World Index. So companies that are widely guarded as having great performance in terms of ESG integration. Although that may be true and that ESG integration may be there, it wasn't enough. The companies that invested in trust and have earned a reputation as trustworthy at a faster recovery speed, they were able to bounce back more quickly from the shock that occurred from COVID. And over time, by the end of the year, had a much more significant recovery. 53% cases compared to 28% cases. That's a pretty significant gap. And a great demonstration, a great model of why trust matters and how trust can pay off. Furthermore, see that trust can, can unlock, why is this? Trust can unlock deeper relationships with your customers. Customers are seven times more willing to pay a premium for your product if they have trust in you. They're seven times willing more to share their data, which can be very useful to your marketing efforts, right? If they have trust and confidence in you. The loyalty, the advocacy, the consideration when they're making a purchasing decision. All of those things are amplified when you've invested in trust. Now, I, we talked a little bit earlier about purpose and the importance of purpose. And purpose is something that's certainly going to come up in many of your sessions this week. It's what pulls us all together. So it brings us here. We're operating with a strong sense of mission, a strong sense of purpose. In the corporate domain, over the past few years, starting with kind of the, the Larry Fink letter from BlackRock that came out in 2019, the sense, the emphasis on purpose has been continually growing. Having purpose front and center is your reason to be, and a purpose that's bigger than just about, well, we're here to make money for our shareholders. This is reorienting like how we sort of define North Stars for business. I would argue that purpose pulls 
but it's really trust that holds people in. So as you're thinking about purpose, the importance of the purpose of our organization, how we talk about our purpose in our marketing campaigns, that's wonderful. Keep that going. That's important. That's the fireworks show that's going to bring people to you. But if you want to keep them there, you have to switch from thinking about the fireworks to instead kind of pivoting to a lighthouse. Keeping that light on in the lighthouse consistently, that's sort of what the metaphor for trust is. It's the, it's the steadiness. It's the reliability. And that is what is going to keep those who came to you because of that alignment on purpose will keep coming back to you because they trust that you are following through in that purpose broadly in the world, wherever that may be, and that the, you're following through on that purpose as it relates to your business relationship with them. So keep this in mind. If you're looking for that mantra, purpose pulls, trust holds. That's what we need to remember. And that's why we need to invest in trust. So let's talk about the stakeholders and how to engage with them. What we're really talking about when we think about how we need to build trust with our organizations, it takes a big commitment to three groups. First is your customers. Second is your people. And third is your ecosystem, that broader sense of players who may be your industry peers. They may be your trading partners or suppliers or vendors. It's a big group. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Why your customers? This is a really compelling data point that came out of uh, Edelman's trust barometer earlier this year. 40 percent of the 28,000, I believe it's 28,000 uh surveyed people, adults that they, they surveyed globally, 40% said, there are brands that I love. I no longer buy from them because I don't trust them. Imagine that. I love this brand. I believe in this brand. I like what this brand offers me, but I don't trust them. So I'm not going to make that purchasing. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put my money with them anymore. And that number goes up even higher when you're talking about higher income individuals. It goes up to 50%. That is a lot of money left on the table because the business invested in purpose and invested in product. It did not invest on the back end of trust. People, another one of our key stakeholders with whom we need to build this relationship of trust. One in four people left their job in the last six months or plan to in the next six months. Why is that? Common response if you talk to executives is it's a competitive market. Someone else is probably able to pay them more. That's not it. The study from Edelman showed that almost double the number of employees are leaving, not because of pay, but because of value alignment. There is that they don't have confidence that their personal values and the values of the organization are aligned. Chances are they, they work in environments where they do not feel that trust is strong. They do not feel that the respect that is sort of represented in trust is extended to them. And so they're looking elsewhere. That's a, that's a really significant number. That gap between pay and values, I think, is probably unlike anything we've seen before. And then there, there's your community, another key group of stakeholders. Whether you're in a nonprofit or you're in a startup like us, you have a number of organizations that are part of this ecosystem with which you may need to re retain, build and retain trust. That's investors or funders or donors. It's regulators. It may be universities with whom you partner on innovation. It could be your volunteers, which could include your board members. Even the environment is part of that ecosystem. And it may not ask a lot back from you directly, but it certainly needs to know that it can count on you to do the right thing on its behalf. So building trust obviously takes these commitments with these different groups. Let's talk a little bit about the how over the next uh, remaining time we have in our session. So what can you do to build trust with customers? First, take a lesson from CPG. No industry spends as much money understanding consumer behavior as consumer packaged goods. So let's look at the trends that are happening in that industry and see what we can take away from that, those trends. What we're seeing, and I've been watching this trend for the past few years, is this uptick in sort of product transparency. So giving you a label, giving customers a label to understand where does this come from, how do we make it, and what's involved with the production. 
And if we want to take that one step further, how does that all add up to pricing that you get? So on the left, Everlane provides a great example. Everlane's entire business model has been based on transparency, being able to tell you where it was made. We don't have any metal men. These are our factories. We make it here. Here's a picture of the factory. And here's how the cashmere sweater is coming your way. You have some sense of how it was produced. But they take that transparency to the next level with explaining the, the cost breakdown. Why does this sweater cost what it does? And why is our cost so much different than a traditional retailer? That's a very compelling story. And being able to provide this information with transparency really created a unique voice for them in a very crowded marketplace. The world didn't have any shortage of places where you could get cashmere sweaters or wool coats. But what made Everlane so attractive so early, so quickly, was that they were able, they made this commitment to transparency and they were able to demonstrate why you should have confidence in their much lower prices. Where does all of that pricing come from? Middle, we have RX bars spelling out right on the front of the package. This is it. Here's everything that's in this product. Nothing else. That's all we have. Clean, simple, clear, transparency. And Oatly on the far right, again, kind of listing out, <laughs> making a commitment to saying, here's everything that's here. We're going to lay it all out in transparency, not just what's in the package, but also making sure you can see our certifications to show that this is FSC certified. The packaging itself is recyclable and was produced in the most responsible way. So once you start noticing this trend, if you haven't already, you will find that you see it everywhere. I saw some clean beauty products the other day that were focused on creating new labels for beauty product packaging. It really is a growing trend. So how do you take part of it? Whether you offer a tangible product or whether you're a services company, there are lessons here that we can take away. Here are some great examples of service companies, two software companies. So we're in the software business. We pay a lot of attention to what software companies are doing. Buffer does the cost breakdown for a service. So when you pay $10 for Buffer, what is it that you get? Where, how much of that goes to salaries versus our profit? Certainly a great, simple way to tell that story. Kickstarter. Very transparent about its values and our mission, making sure that that is front and center on their website. Here is why we're here. This is these are the agreements that we agree that we are operating with, and we are extending those agreements to you. So there are a myriad number of ways in which you can tell your organization's story and create a transparent product label for yourself. Following through on all of that is where the trust comes from, but it begins with the transparency. So. Takeaway, what is one of the things you can go back and do? Ask yourselves as a leadership team, what is on your transparent product label? What are the kinds of things that you could include on your website, in your presentations, on your packaging, wherever that interface is between you and those stakeholders we talked about, your customers, your employees, your ecosystem? How do we share this information? I'll give you a few examples. Stakeholder engagement approach and findings to something I was talking about with someone yesterday. How, who do you engage with? What are the stakeholder groups that you have conversations with along the way? And what came out of those conversations? There is a desire in the investment community, if you're talking about or have aspirations to become a publicly traded company, then investors would like to see that information. They would evidence that the upper levels of management in your organization are paying attention to what your stakeholders have to say. They see this as a hallmark of good governance and a sound strategy. You're actually paying attention to the changing sentiment of those in your universe, right? So being able to describe that, here's who we spoke with. We did some listening surveys. We surveyed our customers. We engaged our employees, being able to summarize that. And you don't have to share all of the data and findings, but a little bit of the how and maybe a couple key findings that you think are useful and that you actually took action upon. Great way of establishing trust. Ownership and funding sources. And I will tell you, anytime I've done, I worked in the nonprofit sector earlier in my career. And now if I'm looking to do work with a nonprofit, one of the first things we're going to do is go look at your 990. You know what's great? When the 990 is already on your website. So I don't have to go do a separate search on GuideStar to find it. So having that information right there on your website 
minimize the search. Don't make people go on an investigative journey to find out information. Bring it all under your umbrella. Show it off. Make that part of your product label. Anything you can share about your management? Who are they? What roles do they have? How does governance work? How do decision-making processes work at your organization? So I, I've spent a lot of time in my role as a sustainability leader looking at how are other organizations rendering or telling the story about their corporate governance as it relates to sustainability. If you go on and look at the reports of Best Buy or a PVH, for example, a couple of retailers, they include in their sustainability reports almost an org chart that says, here is who is accountable for sustainability in our organization. It starts with the board, the CEO, here's their responsibility, here's some working groups, here's a steering committee. Being able to articulate how decisions are made around how you set pay, how you do business, who you do business with, how you work with suppliers, all of that can feed into that sort of pillar of trust that you're trying to create with different stakeholder groups. Your pricing model, we saw examples of those. Composition and diversity, hopefully, if that is the case, of your management and your workforce at all levels of the organization. That is becoming sort of a table stakes discussion. So if you can get ahead of that and start laying that out now, don't worry about perfection. Show what's there. Show the facts and describe your plans on how you're going to improve those numbers. Uh, suppliers and supplier diversity. This is another really important area of the diversity, equity and inclusion sort of umbrella that we don't always do enough talking and sharing about. So if you can articulate that information, we worked with 300 suppliers over the last year. Ten percent of them would qualify as diverse suppliers. Our ambition is to move that number to X over the next five years. And here's how we're going to do that. Very helpful context, very helpful to your suppliers in understanding how you make decisions around procurement and conflicts of interest. Also, another thing that it's just, you know, disclose it. And the, the conflict of interest may not matter as much than if, as if it were been uh, kept hidden. So I want to remind you, as you're thinking about this, don't just look to see what your peers in the industry are doing. Recognize that trust and listening go hand in hand. Listening should or trust should begin with the act of listening and go into your stakeholders. So talk to your stakeholders and find out what really matters to them. What is the data? What is the information about how you operate that they want to see? And bring that their way. Focus. You could develop a list of priorities. I'll tell you, it's not easy to make these decisions to release this information because once you do it, it comes under scrutiny. But pick a few things and commit to it. And I think you will see the payoff. So moving from customers, what does it take to build trust with your people? This is something that I think we think about in many different angles. We, we think about the value of diversity or about pay, but we don't always put it under the sort of umbrella of trust and thinking about trust. And I think if you, if you start with trust and then ask yourself, well, what are the levers where trust could either be built are broken down within our own organization. And, and your employees will probably tell you if you ask them what those levers are. That gives you those clear areas where you can start building strategies that will build and reinforce that trust. Why this matters so much is going back to some metal, recent Edelman studies. My employer is now seen as the most trusted institution within, uh, I believe this is a, a global survey of the past year. So while people are making moves, they are also saying out of all of these other institutions that affect my life, business, NGOs, government, media, my employer is the one I have the most trust in. It's an interesting sort of tension that I have not yet unpacked, but it's important to ask yourselves, well, what is it as an employer that I could be doing to fortify that trust so that they don't make a move? tells you that people are hungry for looking for a trusted relationship with their employer. And until they land on the right one, they're willing to keep moving. Employees are also your most critical stakeholder. Again, going back out of this, like pre-pandemic, customers at the center. It was a widely held belief. That was who you were really in business to serve. Employees came secondarily to that. Now, having gone through what we've experienced in the past year, there is a new understanding that without thinking about your employees, without putting your employees at the center of everything you do, how can you be of service to your customers and clients, let alone the communities where you're operating and your shareholders? It's a remarkable flip 
and one that really drives home the importance of starting our conversations, not with just what do we pay people or how do we give people career progressions or we're doing enough about diversity. Instead, how do we fortify trust in our employee base? How do we keep them moving forward? Here's an example. Uh, and a software company, again, this is where we tend to look. We look at fellow startups. What are they doing? Uh, an organization called Front, they have about 200 people. They're based in the Bay Area. They're practicing transparency in this way, and you can find and read this online. Open goals. Anyone across the entire organization could look at objectives and uh, key results and understand what those are and how we're progressing towards them. Open decision making. They share emails. They share calendars. They share information. They share key decisions. All of that is available to anyone inside the organization. And open feedback loops. Building that listening responding, listening, responding, and making sure that information is available. That is where trust is coming from here. They're making this commitment to keeping that dialogue going. And by making sure that they think about, well, what is it that really affects people's confidence, psychological safety, and values alignment at work? Well, it comes down to who's having conversations. Are we all clear in understanding which direction we're moving in? Do I feel safe by knowing and trusting by knowing what's going on with another organ, a part of the organization, how things are progressing and how it aligns with my work. So cultivating trust by doing some very practical things that are not easy, that are actually radical departures from how most companies operate, but certainly we hope will create a significant difference in the culture of that organization. So what can you do when you think about this in your own organizations? First, define culture, right? Who are we? What do we stand for? Then prioritizing people. And then finally, enabling agency, giving people the ability to stand up, say what's right, articulate their values, live their values in their roles or outside of their roles when it's something that they really care about. Giving people that, that liberty to move, feeling like they have a voice and could put that voice into action in their organizations. All of that work will reinforce trust. So let's talk about the ecosystem a little bit. Outside of your own four walls, the players by on which you have an effect and who can affect the health of your and the success of your business. Again, just to recap the slide we had before, this, this includes a really diverse group of players whose needs all may be very different. And it may be impossible for you to really build strong, trusting relationships with all of these organizations at once. But start by listening. Go to a few organizations where you already have good relationships and start asking questions. What is meaningful to you? What do you need? How can we help? What should we be focused on? What matters? And even what will it take for us to build a more trusting relationship? Just going in with open-ended questions and listening, not promising to respond to everything. You can set that expectation from the beginning, but starting with listening so that you can go back, reflect, prioritize, understand how can we move the needle in this particular area that will have a substantial material impact on a relationship with this particular group. You'd be surprised at what you come up with. And I suspect you may see many sort of commonalities from these different groups will then point you in the right direction of saying, if we make X change, we will be able to deliver significant results and strengthen the relationships we have with these different groups. We see this too in looking at different other tech startups of like picking a, a theme that is really authentic and important to them and something where they can have a meaningful impact and putting that at the centerpiece of their work and of their trusting relations with their community. So a few examples, Dropbox is focusing on human uh, trafficking, a Canva, which allows you to create content uh, is really focused on making sure that their templates and everything represent all of the tools that they provide to content people who are trying to create content really represents like authentic diversity that it's not uniform in its appearance that diversity is represented in a multitude of ways whether it's people places etc um, and then mailchimp small business covid support so thinking about where can we actually make a difference where can we have an impact and then how do we follow through on that so what can you do if you're going back to get started on 
thinking about how we as a management team can strengthen our trustful relationships with our ecosystem. First, think about, well, who is in this community? Like if we really pair it back, if we look at our purpose, who are the, the groups that we really need to have at the table? And then thinking about that purpose in a way that's authentic and something you can follow through on for the long term. And then being authentic and delivering, making sure that you say what you're going to do and you show up and you follow through consistently. That is the piece that's going to make the difference. So we're nearing the end of the conversation. I want to wrap up with three big takeaways to building trust. First is creating that transparent product packaging. Look at the data. Look at the priorities of your stakeholders. Ask yourselves, what is it that we can share about our products or services that will help demonstrate the transparency on which trust is built? Second is elevating the community that makes sense for your brand. As we talked about, bring that all together, understand where is the place where we can actually make a meaningful difference. And then finally, building trust and transparency into your internal cop, uh, culture, not just in a purpose, making a big declaration of our values of what we stand for and why we're here and the change we're going to create in the world, but really driving it through your operations. Because if there is a gap between what you say you stand for and how you actually operate, it will catch up with you pretty quickly. And you will have that one in four of employees kind of making their next move uh, within the next few months. They really need that alignment to believe it. That's where the trust comes from. All of these relationships consist of setting up feedback loops that will allow you to listen and then to demonstrate that response. Make that part of your operations. Make that part of your daily interactions. I know it's easy to get caught up in proposals and pitches and presentations, but that's different than listening. And it's different than going back and saying, we heard you and here's how we responded. And that, I think, is what organizations and individuals are really hungry for today, being heard, being responded to, and having confidence that it's not smoke and mirrors, it's not greenwashing, it's legitimate, and you can back it up with data. So I'm going to close with just a few minutes about who One Trust is. Uh, we're, as I mentioned, we're a software as a service company based in Atlanta. We started about five years ago. We've been very fast growth. And we're really committed to making trust a competitive advantage for organizations, focusing on the different dimensions of trust that we kind of call the trust fabric. Um, just a few call outs. We're proud to say our, we're, our people who've been here for five years are very proud to say that we were recognized as the number one fastest growing company by Inc. 500 last year. It was a great achievement. It took a lot of hard work for people who came here long before I did. So I can't take credit for that. We've done uh, very successful in our fundraising. We're currently in Series 3 funding. We have 10,000 customers of all sizes, big customers, small customers. That's the beauty of software as a service is the accessibility. And you can offer any size organization access to affordable tools that will help them make trust a competitive advantage in their organizations. And we have about 2,000 employees. Most of them are in um, R&D and we're located around the world with our headquarters in Atlanta and in London. Um, we're a company that's built to last, very focused on customer success, a solid infrastructure, and a partner network. And we're also very big on third-party certifications. One of the great points of pride of One Trust is that we hold ourselves to very high standards. We were the first organization to receive the ISO 27701 certification for privacy management. Very proud of that accomplishment. Why are we widely used? We are a technology platform with a very unique patents. We continually do regulatory research that supports our core products related to privacy, security, and compliance. We have a very large number of certified professionals, and we have the largest active community for best practices in these areas. That is my presentation for today. I'm so grateful that you joined me and thank you very much for your time and uh, look forward to any questions that we may have. Oh, thanks for the feedback. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Alex. It was a real pleasure to be here. Oh, I have a question. You mentioned trust was more important than purpose. I would not say more important. I would say as important. And I think we are spending a lot of effort on conversations related to purpose. But if we don't have trust and a commitment to trust to back up that purpose, 
We're going to miss out. People will come for the fireworks of purpose, but they will stay because of the lighthouse of trust. So keep that in mind. How active is one trust in emerging and frontier markets? That is a great question. And I am not in the market side, but Mark, if you would like to email me at pfitzpatrick at onetrust.com, I could probably forward that over to someone who could answer that question for you. Any tips for ensure, starting off ensuring that trust is built right from the start? That's a great question, Melanie. Um, I think... Melanie, start small is always a really great way to go. So pick one area where trust really matters. And again, let's look at Everlane. Everlane decided, look, we're going to offer, we're a vertically integrated company. We're going to offer something at a lower price. And we're going to demonstrate why that price is low and make that part of our brand. That was sort of in my read of the Everlane strategy. But if you're starting with your own organizations and you don't have a tangible product, where you can say, well, this is how we landed at our pricing, or here's how we're demonstrating why when you buy this product that the larger social purpose that we've connected to that, actually um, how we're following through in that commitment, which I think is another really good opportunity if you're doing any bundling of like social purpose or social impact and a product or service, demonstrate that link. How can how what transparency can you provide around that connection between what you're selling and the bigger impact that you're claiming to make in the world? Because, you know, there will be skeptics. I'm one of the greatest ones having been in both the nonprofit and private sector. So, you know, think about how you tell that story and provide data that gives your customers and stakeholders the assurance that you're following through on what you're claiming you're going to do. So but Melanie, I would suggest start small. Take, take one thing where you think it's going to make a big difference. And if you're not sure what that is, ask your customers, ask your stakeholders, the communities in which you operate, ask your employees. They'll tell you. They'll tell you where it really matters. How do you move your enterprise clients from seeing their database line on ESG metric to actually taking action to improve on those baselines? Oh, Evan, we could do a whole other conversation about that one. Love. That, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I, I think. Sometimes, Evan, that in my experience, the action, the taking action can come from a few different places. One is a crisis. Like, sadly, sometimes we only see action after there has been a major crisis. For example, in the apparel industry, the collapse of Rana Plaza really shook up the apparel industry and made some new, like, generated some new commitments to improving factory conditions. So a crisis is one. Short of a crisis, I think there's got to be some kind of a business case. Can you share data? Customers need this. Expectations have changed. And how do you pull the data to show that the expectations that, yes, it's great that you're measuring this, but here's where you need to be. Like Businesses have finite, we all have finite resources. So figuring out how to commit to um how to commit those resources to moving the needle on a particular ESG metric always has to come from a business case. Yes, Mark, you can, uh, that is right. P, uh, P Fitzpatrick at OneTrust.com. Anyone can, can uh, reach me at that email address. Melanie is uh, the marriage of storytelling and metrics. Now share how you're working in a way that trust. Yes. That's a great way of saying it, Melanie, you should be good to giving this presentation next time. Nice summary. So just so everyone sees Melanie's kind of sharing that, Storytelling and metrics can help kind of put together a story of how you're working in a way that shareholders can trust right from the start. Melanie, I would add to that and showing that over time. So if you say we're making this change in this area, does the data actually show that over time? And I think trust also comes from being willing to say we didn't figure it out yet. We didn't get it right. We fell. We didn't, our data this year shows that we didn't achieve the results that we wanted to. And here's why we think that happened. And here's what we're going to do. So admitting failures, I think showing vulnerability is another great way to show trust. And you can do that safely from your organizational or corporate perspective. It takes some finessing, but it's doable. So I'd encourage you to think about that. We're about at time. And I really appreciate all the comments and questions that came in. Thank you so much for joining today. And I look forward to reconnecting with you. Enjoy the rest of SoCap.